came here uh, to share my personal story, how I came to the field, and how I traveled uh, from country to country with uh, some of uh, Alexei's sample in my pocket, uh, first bringing them uh, from Russia to Germany and then to the US. Um, and been lucky working with some of the very best uh, people in this field, and this is, I think, my first paper first paper on um, cut selenide quantum dots, and you recognize familiar names, uh, Sasha and Alexei. The paper was endorsed uh, for this journal, Solid State Communications. Rare opportunity uh, for us to publish in the uh, English language journal at that time, endorsed by my PhD advisor, Keldish. Well known, of course, best known for Franz Keldish effect, but uh, the guy actually has done quite tremendous job in the area of lower dimensional semiconductors. He predicted, for example, the enhancement in the exciton binding energy uh, back long ago before the quantum wells, considering this semiconductor layer, ultra thin layer sandwiched between uh, two dielectrics. I'm going to talk about this paper a bit uh, more. Uh, we had this wonderful introduction from Alexei about the history. What are the samples we looked at at the end of 80s and the beginning of 90s? Okay, these are the samples. Still alive, still sit. Uh, in my office in the shelf, okay, 20, probably five, six, or maybe even seven years old, so they might not have good dispersity or high emission quantum melt, but they are robust like a rock, I'm sure. Now put the samples, quantum dots, in glass matrices. Under the laser now, I'm gonna get the same properties, I'm gonna get the same spectra. Okay? Not only we looked at the simple samples, okay, at that time already we explored some of the ideas which are becoming a matter of fashion these days. Ion exchange started back in the early 90s. This is a work in Karolansky lab at the Lebedev Institute. Ion exchange starting with cadmium sulfide, exchanging cadmium for copper, and I have a few papers on copper uh, sulfide. Okay? The samples different kind of colors. You cannot see them well. At that time, we already realized you can have all these different uh, stoichiometries for copper, various levels of deficiency. Okay. So samples clearly show the confinement. So you see the absorption bit, then the shift as you make samples smaller. Okay, the problems, of course, if you look at some of the samples, this is just linear transmission. You don't see sharp features. Again, okay, my topic is ultra fast and nonlinear spectroscopy today, and of course, this is where this type of technique is becoming useful. Okay, these are the spectra taken probably in the 90, 1990 in our lab, home-built Yag laser, uh, two hertz laser, you can count the pulses, boom, 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 still in my head when you spend 10 hours a day listening to this noise. Okay, uh, this is a pump probe experiment, so you excite with the second harmonic of Niadium Yag 552. Okay, you size select nanocrystals and you don't see much in the linear absorption, but you start seeing these beautiful, beautiful features in transient absorption. Okay, at that time, we reinvented transient absorption spectroscopy because we didn't read much of the English type literature. Differential transmission, this is what we had to come up with from scratch. Okay, so you resolve the first shell. This is what we call one shell these days. Okay, you crank up the intensity, you put two electrons into this state, you saturate that, you start to build the 1p shell, six electrons there, you go to the D shell, beautiful data. Actually, uh, I wouldn't be ashamed of this data right now. Okay. Uh, we could look at dynamics, again, using pump probe spectroscopy, you look at the bandage, you see this nanosecond dynamics, now we know single exciton by excitons, you go at higher, energies, and of course now you're looking at the gear of the multi-extents, everything back in the 1990. Okay, commercial samples. Somebody, of course, knows that these days you can get some dots from evident, maybe NN labs. At that time, we could also get some commercial samples, and people who are proficient in Russian language might probably realize what these samples are. Anybody in the audience? Transmission spectra of commercial cut-off filters, okay? KC15, red glass number 15. Okay, at that time, we learned the secret. Okay, these samples, these filters, uh, technology developed probably in the 40s and the 50s, and Alexei would correct me if I'm wrong. 
were made by dispersing cadmium sulfide, selenite, and molten glasses, essentially in the same way which was later applied to grow well-controlled quantum dots by Yakimov. But these samples were just normal filters available in the lab. OK, we use them for some meaningful studies. First of all, how they actually quantum dots. This is bandage, transmission one. OK, transmission reduces. This is a cutoff low-pass filter. OK, let's do a bit of. Uh, massaging, power point massaging, we take this region and rotate it by 180 degrees. And of course, now you recognize, OK, this is a well familiar one, this feature, OK? So we are looking actually at quantum dots. OK, with some a bit of patience, you test a bunch of these samples. And this is our favorite filter, KC19, red glass 19. OK, doing Raman spectroscopy, analyzing for replicas. Okay, you can see that there is almost no cut sulfide there. So it's just cadmium selenide, so pure cut selenide quantum dots. And I love this sample still have in my drill cabinet. So pure cut selenide quantum dots, which I used for the first time to actually study quite interesting phenomenon by exciton effect, Coulombic effects in ultra-fast transit absorption. The studies which I started back as a Humboldt fellow in Aachen, where I spent 93 and 94, working on this crazy machine, CPM, laser colliding pulse laser, which eventually was dismantled. But this laser allowed me, for the first time, to look into this ultra-fast world of nanocrystals. With Neodym Yag, I was limited by 20 picoseconds. With CPM, I could look at some picosecond time scales. And that's really something interesting. Okay? So typically, with long pulses, we see bleaching features. But if I looked at very short time scales, 300 seconds, this is what you see. Okay? Very unusual. So you see this derivative-like feature, induced absorption below the main transition, bleach, and a couple of more bleaches. Took us a while, as uh, Alexis said. You know, at that time, we were just learning. So what's going on now, you will say immediately. Of course, you guys looked at the Coulombic shift. It took me a few days of jogging around the Institute in Aachen until I figured out what's going on. And again, this is the picture. OK, we had the model in this PIB. I'm not going to torture you with this model. So the carrier is first excited in the high energy state. So the second harmonic of CPM for electron volt. And that should give me a lot of time, actually, to look at unperturbed bandage. There is no carriers at the bandage. So the lowest energy transitions are only affected by Coulombic effects. So you make the exciton, you're trying to make the second exciton, and the second exciton knows that there is electric field inside the sample. It moves the transition. You create a new absorption. That's why you have a new absorption at low energies. And then you're removing the old absorption. You have bleach at higher energies. And that explains this derivative-like feature. Then the carrier relaxes. OK, now everything is dominated by state filling, although the Coulombic shift is still there. It's simply dominated by uh, the effect of the state filling. You analyze the amplitude of the switches, and you get a very useful quantity, very unusual, by the way, quantity. The bi exciton binding energy, 30 milli electron volts. Somebody who knows bulk cut selenide would be surprised, because the binding energy of bi excitons in bulk cut selenide is about for MEV. OK, so this is the first science, the first glimpse in the physics of multi excitons greatly enhanced interactions manifested in the spectra and very strongly manifested in dynamics. OK? This is what we figured out can be also used to evaluate the intraband relaxation. Okay? This is a bit later studies. Again, historically, I came to Los Alamos in 95, build up the transit absorption system from scratch, you know, wrote all this software, which my postdocs used maybe even five years ago. And one guy just to rewrote, rewrote everything. He said, no, I don't like your interface. All right. Um, so these are again looking uh, now. Of course, no CPM, thanks God. It was a tie stuff, which laser I love. OK, and still in love, second harmonic of the tie stuff laser, exciting. The sample looking at the intraband relaxation. We're looking at the buildup, OK? So 1.2 picoseconds build up of the bandage absorption feature, OK? Bandage bleach, complement relaxation of the uh, one piece state. OK, and these are, this is the induced absorption feature, which is below the main transition due to this Coulombic shift. You see, it relaxes exactly 
uh, as the decay of 1p population. And simply, this is due to suppression of this Coulombic effect um, due to kind of the observable suppression of Coulombic effect due to growing state filling. So it's which is easy to observe. It's a very nice tool to look at the intraband relaxation. It's a nice tool. OK, look at the time scales. Again, quite surprising, 300 frames per second here for the relaxation. And this is for samples where 1s, 1p splitting is 8 to 10 allo phonon energies. You would expect severe phonon bottleneck mentioned by Alexi. It did not happen. OK, and that time already looking at glass samples, we realize there is a size dependence. You make your sample smaller, you increase the, you increase the gap between 1s and 1p state. You expect even more phonon bottleneck. Instead, something different happens. Relaxation becomes crazy fast. It's just getting faster. So obviously, it was not phonon-mediated relaxation. That was the conclusion. Okay, relaxation dominated by electron hole energy transfer. Again, new phenomenon, new phenomenon enabled by this extreme quantum confinement. Cool stuff, really. OK, back to this paper, 1990, my first study of Fourier recombination in nanocrystals. Okay. At that time, it's back in Russia. Okay, at that time, we had actually a unique machine developed just for the few institutions in Russia. This is the ultra-fast three camera. By 1980, it was a terrific machine. 20 picosecond time resolution, sensitive enough to look at emission uh, from this castellanite quantum dot, dots in glass matrices. Okay, very interesting observation. We look at the intensity of the emission lifetimes, and we saw this correlated change. You go from a linear dependence to quadratic, and the intensity simultaneously, you see the drop in the lifetime. And we correctly assign that to observation of the Auger recombination. We look at two sizes, and we saw certain size effects. So the initial time constant changes depending on the sign from about two nanoseconds to about a few hundreds of picoseconds for smaller sizes. Of course, that was not sufficient to infer the exact size dependence. And this is where colloidal samples with perfectly defined sizes have become extremely useful to evaluate the size-dependent trend. And physics of quantum dots, of course, is about the size-dependent trends. OK, really grateful to Munji. He's in the audience. Provided me uh, this for samples. Catherine Leffardell, a student in Munji's group, made samples for us. I have still a few of uh, these pieces, museum pieces, sitting in my office. Nobody's going to get. I'm still waiting for me. Until I sell them at the auction, I'm still waiting for the right price. Okay, of course, solvent is gone, but they still there is some residue still shows some emission. Beautiful samples. Look at this. Okay, so all these features, something which is very hard to see in the glass samples. Okay, so and of course uh, this collaboration between Los Alamos ultrafast spectroscopy uh, and fantastic colloidal synthesis developed at MIT produced. A lot of useful stuff, OK? Guys, read our old papers starting in 98, 99, and so on and so forth, okay, establishing the transit absorption that was dominated by electrons, uh, establishing Poissonian statistics of photo excitation. Everybody uses that, okay, comparing electron and hole dynamics, looking at the effects of the trapping, okay, attempt, attempts to detect optical gain, first unsuccessful, then successful. So that, all this. Uh, work resulting from this collaboration. Okay. This is an important piece of work, revisiting again the topic of Jerry combination, but now with these high quality samples. Samples which allowed us to infer this clear size dependent, very pronounced size dependent trends in Jerry combination. K applying uh, our transit absorption spectroscopy, which is beautiful samples. We were able to see decay of four excitons, three excitons by excitons, single excitons, and this is what we call quantization of Auger recombination rates, so discrete steps in Auger decay. Importantly, the size dependence was really clean, really clear, seen for all these multi-exciton states. Auger lifetime scaled as a volume, okay, R cubed. First observation confirmed eventually, essentially for all monocomponent nanocrystals, if you don't do a funky thing to a quantum dot, you don't know the structure that, my belief is you're gonna see that, okay? So we tested that, looking at a large number of different quantum dots, including direct gap materials in infrared, wide gap, uh, narrow gap, indirect germanium. 
Okay, and this is replotted not in the form of the lifetime, but in the form of the Auger constant as a function of the size. And a typical value measured in these measurements is by external lifetime can be related to the Auger constant by this simple relationship. Okay, so why I did that? Why we did that? Because we knew Auger constants of bulk materials. But very interesting to see what happens with the very combination as you go from the bulk to the quantum dot regime. Okay, these are the constants for this large selection of bulk materials, and this is logarithmic scale. You see the Auger constant different by six decays between indium arsenide and germanium. Germanium indirect takes a phonon also to perform Auger recombination. But you make now ultra small particles, and what happens, first of all, you recover the same size dependence Again, this magic IQ of dependence for all type of compositions. Not only that, the magnitude, the lifetimes themselves, surprisingly similar despite these orders of magnitude difference in properties of the bulk system. Amazing observation tells us in these particles, in the regime of extreme quantum confinement, material composi composition or specificity of some band structure almost does not matter, size and shape. And now we know the shape of the interfacial potential. This is what matters. Envelope wave function, let's say that way. So block function seems to be not very important, okay? And this had a very direct relevance to the problem of the lasing, which we really took us a few years to figure it out. People were blasting these quantum dots in solution with powerful lasers, no lasing. Samples had pretty decent quantum mills at that time. And so it took us a while to figure out what was going on, why they wouldn't lace. Okay, and that relates again to the fundamental physics of the system. Okay, let's look at the lasing problem and the quantum dots. Simplest case, the bandage transition. This is a two-level, two-fold degenerate system, which is important. You have two electrons in the ground state. You excite one electron across the energy gap, you excite a single exciton, okay? You hope to get gain, you're not gonna get that because the stimulated emission by this electron is precisely compensated by the electron in the ground state. You are dealing with a situation of so-called optical transparency. To excite optical gain, you have to produce the second exciton. You need a bi-exciton. This is the conclusion which we made in 2000. Very important conclusion, lasing, Optical gain in the system explicitly relies on emission from by excitons. Again, of course, you immediately realize the problem. This is what I call ultra small quantum dot paradox. You need by excitons to produce stimulated emission. You want light from them. But these species, like 2 dk Auger process, extremely short lifetimes, much shorter than typical radiative time constants. Okay, what was the solution? Okay. Luckily, I graduated from the physics department with specializing in lasing, okay? So we knew in order to resolve this problem, we simply need to look at the development time of stimulated emission, not spontaneous, and the lifetime of stimulated emission. Of course, in addition to the dipole moment of your transition linked directly to the density of your emitters, okay? It's collective effect. One dot stimulate the other, these dots stimulate the other. You know, the quantum dots increasing the packing density can build up the gain in such a way that the growth time of stimulated emission becoming shorter than a recombination, and that was a simple secret, okay? So using Munji's quantum dots, we assembled them into this type of solids, okay? This is what we got, okay? Quite exciting. Sasha Mikolovsky was the first to observe this in the lab. Okay, this very nice amplified spontaneous emission feature, single, uh, uh, single pass lasing essentially. Eventually we did some more work putting our quantum dots in different types of cavity, DFB cavity developed at MIT, uh, ring cavity, uh, which we utilized uh, in our work uh, at Los Alamos. Okay, was it the first observation of the quantum dot lasing? Must be honest, guys, we did that. We did that back in 91. Okay, in Russia. Maybe we didn't understand all the details of the physics, but we did see lasing. Okay? But we realized okay, in some of the samples, the bleaching was so large that it resulted in the negative excited absorption. Okay, so we were looking at the optical gain. So it was the optical gain feature, as we know now, associated with the bi-excitons. Okay, the gain due to 1p feature, 
and this is one key feature. Yeah, remember, samples very large. It's very difficult to see all these features in small samples. These are very large nanocrystals, okay? The optical gain, if I remember correctly, for the P-band saturated optical gain was only 10 inverse centimeter, very dilute uh, suspension of the quantum dust within the glass matrix, okay? Dima Okrik of my student at the time, he made a cavity, very simple cavity, he took the team of samples, polished on both sides, put the electric mirrors on top. Okay, here we go. We saw lasing, okay? Real lasing at eta Kelvin. At the P-band, we couldn't get lasing there because we didn't have enough gain, okay? So it was about probably one inverse centimeter. But with 10 inverse centimeters, we had enough gain to obtain lasing. It's not the paper which is credited with the invention of the quantum dot laser. This is the paper which is credited with the invention of the quantum dot laser, Bimberg and Lustinov. Paper came three years later, okay? Cited 804 times, 25 citations for this paper, okay? All right, this is a little bit consolation prize. So when we did that publish in science, so we got finally that. But I really wish that people would remember when actually <laughs> the first quantum dot laser was demonstrated. All right, going on. <laughs> so physics, again, physics is quite helpful. I told you about these measurements of the 30 MeV uh, by extent binding energy. Okay, it turns out this very large carrier carrier interactions can help us resolve the problem of this bi exciton again, resolve the problem of a jury combination. Why we need bi exciton? We need a bi exciton because of the twofold degeneracy of the band H exciton, right? So you need population inversion. Okay, let's try to break this degeneracy. It's actually intrinsically broken due to Coulombic interaction between two ground state excitons. The energy of the interactions, however, is small compared to the line width. Okay? And it shifts the absorption in the wrong direction, so it shifts absorption down, so bringing in strong absorption towards the emission band. What you want to do, you want to shift your absorption features up. You want to have your lasing within the energy gap, and this is possible by enforcing exciton-exciton repulsion, large exciton-exciton repulsion. This is when we realized that it's possible. It's possible using type two systems. In this specific case, this is a cortical cut sulfide zinc selenide system, which has type two interface. You excite one exciton in the system, so you charge separate due to this intrinsic energy gradient which drives the system against the Coulombic force, because Coulombic force wouldn't do this. You need the right energy gradient in the system. You excite the second exciton, it does the same. And look what's happening. Now you have two charges of the same sign in very close proximity from each other, and at the same time, you separate across the heter interface the charges of the different sign. So you are building up, you are increasing the repulsion in this way, and you are reducing the attraction overall effect is a giant repulsion, about 100 MeV or more. Okay, that shifts your absorption up in energy by this Coulombic shift, and that allowed us for the first time to observe the single exciton gain right at the center of the single exciton emission. At high affluences, you start uh, seeing the usual by exciton gain, and according again to this model of the exciton exciton repulsion, it ha happens at high spectral energy, okay? So these are repulsive by excitons, okay? But the ultimate solution to the problem, of course, to get rid of a jury combination whatsoever, and there's been big, big effort in our group for a significant time since the first observation of this lasing due to colloidal quantum dose. Turns out that the problem of Auger decay suppression closely relates to the problem of blinking. So in 2008, two papers appeared, okay, essentially simultaneously coming from our group and from Binoa's group. Thick shell, cut selenide, cut sulfide quantum dots, where you use silo method, deposition developed by Peng, in order to grow ultra thick shell of cut sulfide 12, where it published at that time 19 one layer paper. And that allows to nearly completely suppress blinking. Some of the dots were rock stable if you look at single dot emission for hours, okay? And later, we have shown that blinking, at least in these fictional structures, is due to charging, is, and is charging, you form a trion, a charged exciton. Okay, you activate a recombination, and that transfers the dot to the low emissivity state because of the recombination, okay? And then the blinking was suppressed. What did it mean? We didn't know. 
was it suppression of charging discharging, or was it the suppression of fragile recombination? It took us about a year to figure out what was going on. This is the measurement by Florin Garcia, Santa Marina, our lab, looking at our recombination combination in standard quantum dots versus this giant quantum dots uh, with the same band gap. Okay? This is typical signature of uh, Auger decay, bi-excitons and multi-excitons. Long time scale, that's why it looks like a spike. But in these giant dots, Auger decay become, become very well resolvable on this long nanosecond time scale. The decay becomes much slower than in standard nanocrystals. Okay? So it told us the suppression of the blinking in this case, it was largely related to the suppression of a recombination, very strong suppression of a recombination, at least in some of the quantum dots. Okay? Right? Implications for lasing. Of course, this is one of my favorite topics. Of course, we tested these dots for lasing. Okay? We looked at the optical gain, and you remember, in standard quantum dots, we had this narrow band gain due to bioxytones. Now, with this long Roger lifetimes, we can squeeze out gains not only from bioxytones, we can squeeze out gain from multi-excitons populating the high energy quantized shells. And this is what we saw. We saw very broad band gain, 500 MeV gain. And we saw this multi mode amplified spontaneous emission, also very exciting results. So multi mode emission ampl amplification due to three quantized shells. Okay, and the threshold was also extremely low, about 50, 50 microjoule per square centimeter, while in standard dots, it's about 5 millijoule per centimeter squared. Okay. And the last topic, get two for the price of one. Carrier multiplication, direct, direct, indirect relevance, of course, to Auger recombination and Auger recombination. Okay, you start with three carriers, for example, two electrons in a hole, you recombine. One exciton energy is transferred to this electron, ends up in the excited state. And carrier multiplication, exactly the opposite. You start with the high energy electron, you relax this electron by creating a new exciton. Okay, matrix element is the same. Densities of states involved in the process are different. Okay. Auger recombination we knew is greatly enhanced. Okay, expectation was this is also enhanced. And of course, big promoter of this phenomenon was Auger of was art nosic because of its direct relevance to the problem of solenge conversion. Okay, and not works at NREL. And of course, he was interested in this process because potentially it helped us to double for the current at certain energies above the threshold and in this way to boost the power conversion efficiency to about 40% with a standard Schottky quasi limit of 30%. Okay. So the key in the observation of the effect, which we reported for the first time in 2004, was actually using Auger recombination for detecting these multi-excitons. Okay, again, just to remind you, single excitons, uh, and in these studies we used lead selenide quantum dots. Uh, in lead selenide quantum dots, single excitons especially slow, so it's microsecond time scales, but due to universal behavior of Auger lifetimes, you make a bioexciton and Auger lifetimes it's shorter than 100 picoseconds, okay? So it's very clean signature if you apply transit absorption spectroscopy or transit photoluminescence spectroscopy, okay? And this is the idea of the experiment. You pump at very low pump fluencies. You just increase the photon energy below the threshold, and there is, of course, a theoretical threshold of at least two energy gaps. You expect just to see single extonic dynamics. You cross the threshold. You start generating this multiple species from a single photon. You activate a recombination. These are the measurements by which Scheller Experiments conducted in 2003, published, we published them in 2004. So this is exactly what we observed. Okay, so increasing the photon energy, we saw the development of these OJ signatures. Okay, it took us a while to figure out how to accurately measure the effect, and it was a large group of people helping to figure out all this issue, which can uh, be caused by photocharging, for example, by uh, Coulombic interaction, uh, some interference from this effect in the measurements. But this is I think a nice set of data which I would like to share with you, just standard lead selenide quantum dots, and I'm going to show you, in addition to this historic perspective, which I spent like 25 minutes on, I'm going to also show some recent results. Okay, so these are the data for lead selenide quantum dots, several sets of data, okay, which include spectroscopic observations, okay, and this is plotted in the form of the quantum efficiency as a function of the photon energy normalized by the energy gap. Comparison to the bulk, this is bulk, Misha Bonds and co is measurement. Okay, theoretically, uh, the effect has a threshold at least of two energy gap, 
and so-called electron hole pair creation energy uh, equal to the energy gap, and that defines the slope. This is the cost of a new electron hole pair, which is produced via this Coulombic impact ionization-like sketchwork. Okay. So in the bulk, the threshold is uh, much greater than the slowest limit, and of course the slope is much slower compared to this ideal value. And if we go to the quantum, those spectroscopic measurements from several groups in very good correspondence, <coughs> you see the drop in the threshold to below three energy gap, approaching the fundamental limit, and the slope is also improving. So it seems like working well. Okay, and this is confirmed by the measurements uh, in the photocurrent. These are devices developed by Art Nozick and co-workers. Okay, it seems to be working well in terms of the quantum efficiency. Unfortunately, not good enough to approach 40% in the power conversion efficiency. We need to do better, especially with regard to the slope, which is defined by this quantity. Okay, recently we developed a model published last year, which is uh, called the, uh, the window of opportunity model, where we derived this explicit relationship for epsilon. Okay, which related uh, to the cooling rate defined in terms of the energy loss rate. So how much energy is lost during interbench relaxation? Yeah, I will just need maybe you know, two more minutes. Um, in terms of the energy relax per unit time, and this is characteristic time of the process itself. And in order to make more effect, more, the effect more efficient, to reduce epsilon, which would increase the steepness, so you either want to slow down cooling or you want to make the process of Coulombic collision faster. So it's kind of obvious, right? Very intuitive expression. Probably without even a model, you can write it. Okay. This is our recent uh, uh, effort to control intraband relaxation. The paper will soon appear in Nature Communications. Okay. Now this is the giant analog of cut, uh, selenite cut sulfide dot, but developed for the infrared. So they contain a lead selenite core with a giant cut selenite shell. Okay, very thick shell, okay? Checks half uh, of the total radius, okay? So if you look at the energy alignment, so there is no energy offset in the conduction band. There is a large energy offset in the valence band, so electrons are not confined. And if you conduct this uh, numerical modeling starting with the lead selenite uh, large particles, and then what you do, you're gonna keep the size of the particle the same. You just increases the cut selenite shell thickness electron states almost do nothing, uh, just due to difference in the electron masses for electrons between uh, lead selenide, cut selenide, we see some reduction uh, in the energies. Okay, but uh, Hall really feel uh, the change in the size of the core. And I'm going to look at this 2S state, which is the state we believe is relevant, very relevant to the process of carrier multiplication. Okay, first, the energy of this state increases as we build up the shell, progressively confining the hole to the core. But then suddenly the trend changes. Okay? And what does it mean if you look at the calculation of the wave functions? Happens something which is probably obvious. Okay? So hole from becoming core localized jumps in the shell, becomes shell localized. Okay? And that, of course, leads to the decoupling between these two states, which expected to lead to very significant slowing down in interbench relaxation. Okay? conduct the experiment, uh, so we, uh, we're, these are the real images of the samples developed in the lab, beautiful, really beautiful samples. Okay, you see the signatures of this quasi-type 2 regime, so when you confine calls stronger, reduce electron hole overlap, bandage emission gets slower. This is really a really remarkable result, okay? As the aspect ratio defined as the shell thickness divided by the total radius approaches 0.5, very suddenly develops emission from the shell. And this is the sign of these changes in the localization of the hole going from the core to the shell, okay? Now, hole is in the shell, okay? It's decoupled from the core state, lives long enough to produce emission. So a very, very nice two-band spectra shown by the sample it shows us that, yeah, indeed, we made something, something new. Okay, it's difficult to observe this type of two emissions. And okay, now we're building up the shell. We are looking at the multi-exit on yield, starting just with plain lead selenide, quantum dots, increasing uh, the shell thickness from 20%. Okay, we are going first through 60%. Now we're entering the regime of slowed cooling when we see the visible band in addition to infrared band, and quantum will grow to 80%. Fourfold enhancement for the same energy gap. Okay, so this is kind of very interesting results. Okay, give us okay, new hopes that uh, with quantum dots, we can potentially approach this ultimate limit in uh, conversion of, photo, of uh, solar photons into electric, electrical charges. Okay? Thank you for listening to me. It was a really great experience sharing all these experiment, ex experiences. 
okay, which extends across two continents, three countries, and the distance of about 10,000 kilometers. Okay, started with the optical filters, okay, going to this Kindle and displays, and I'm putting this black box. I don't know what's going to happen next year, so maybe room temperature single photon cells using colloidal quantum dots. MEG solar cell, who knows? Many thanks to all the people who accompanied me on this quest, exciting, exciting quest. My collaborators in Russia, Germany, US, Italy, and newer collaborators in Korea, our group, and all these people who have been in Los Alamos in our group of, with whom we shared this excitement of the quantum dot research. Many thanks to you guys. All right, and I'd like to finish with this slide. We, looks like we're entering the era of celebrations. <laughs> You won't believe it. It's been 20 years of quantum dot research at Los Alamos. We're going to have a workshop, and we're going to, so far, no website or anything. So we're going to set up a website. Jeff Pichuga is on the organizing committee. He is here. Um, Sergio Bravelli represents Italy. He's also on the organizing committee. Soon, hopefully, we'll have a website. So the week reserved for this event is right after the MRS meeting. Um, so it, it will be convenient for people to just jump on the plane and come from San Francisco to Albuquerque. All right, and again, thanks for your attention. Thank you.